I'm Jane Frankenberger, again, from Purdue University. Um, I do want to point out from the beginning that I'm not the main person who strategized and figured out how to get this installed. Uh, Laura Bowling, who is not here, and then also a key graduate student, Kyle Brooks, really did a lot of the work in getting this set up. So we needed a new system in 2012, and based on the fact that we knew we would have submergence, uh, we went with the an inline flow meter and the electromagnetic seemed like it had the most advantages, um, although I look, look forward to hearing the others, and we went with a Crone Water Flux 3070. And the electromagnetic flow monitors, all of them are using Faraday's law to um, get the, the velocity of water. And in this particular meter, you have to buy a signal converter that's separate from the meter, and the cost for the two together is about $4,000. And I just checked before I got on, and it's still about the, the same. So at the site, what, what we were concerned about was, well, first of all, we needed a culvert to have ongoing access to the, the flow meter. We had previously installed other ones that we had just buried, and that could have been done. But in order to correct any problems, we thought we should open it with a culvert. We also were concerned about low flow, and I'll show that in the next slide. And because of that, we've got the 8-inch main out of the, the plot going down to a 3-inch PVC that goes through the flow meter. What this actually looks like in the culvert is this. Here's the 8-inch from the field, and then it's down uh, so that it's continually full, and it's in a three inch so that we could get fairly low flows measured. At the site, we've got the, the culvert, as, we, as I just showed you, that has the flow meter in it, and then it goes out to the signal converter, which is in the box with other instruments like the ISCO uh, sampler, and it's going to a data logger here, and this just shows in the box what the signal converter looks like. So those are two separate things. The challenges and level of difficulty, I think I can say with confidence that this was quite challenging. And um, there, the, the sensor and signal converter do not come with a data logger. So we needed to get it to the external data logger. And there were a lot of issues figuring out what pulse, you know, we had many pulse output channels and which went to the, you know, which was which for the Campbell data logger. And I know that Kyle Brooks was sometimes frustrated by a user manual from Germany that was not quite as clear as um, he wished it would be. And so I've, I've put this photo up here of, we did this for a couple reasons. One was just to check the flow, but also to understand what pulses were going into what. So this is a, a, a system of four different flow meters in a row, and water is being pumped through it, you see coming out here, um, and power supply. And he's just doing the testing to make sure that we understood it to get it set up. And then it went into a, a data logger. So it's, I, I would say that it was fairly challenging. The other big challenge of our system was that um, the installation, we were doing it in four different plots, and we installed wires to go from each of those systems that I just showed you to a central data logger where the cellular modem is. And we believe that these long wires buried underground in a plastic conduit, I don't know if it would have been different with a metal conduit, but they're in plastic. Um, but we believe that's the cause for the reason that we had three lightning strikes during the five-year period that we have used these. I did again talk to the manufacturer, the representative for whom we bought them, um, and he said for sure today you would want to go with a wireless transmitter. Uh, it may, was not available at that time, but it would cost an extra $2,000. So instead of installing these long wires, we could today put in a transmitter and receiver to the data logger. So uh, that gives some ideas for anyone looking forward. So low flow is certainly an issue with any of these meters. And we did a lot of checking here. I've just sort of summarized it. When we went down to a three inch diameter, the minimum velocity, which means the velocity that's being measured at less than plus or minus 5% accuracy um, was 4.2 liters per minute. And often our system is below that, but we're just taking the, the fact that, um, you know, so we're losing some accuracy below that. We did weighing of, you know, going, we could have gone down to a two inch or we could have just gone down to a four inch and we would have less accuracy at low flows. 
but Crone gives you a very nice curve that's like this and compares it to the EU directive so you know what your um, accuracy is. At the higher flows, it's 0.2% accuracy. So we, we balanced the head loss through a smaller pipe with the greater accuracy. Um, under submerged flow, this, this, this is the great advantage of this meter, and this is why we purchased it, because we knew we had submerged flow. Not only submerged flow, at our difficult site, we actually have backwards flow, and that's because the main that it's draining into will back up all the way to the ditch. So the ditch backs up, and then it backs up the, the, the county main, and it backs up to our site. So these are plotted, both the forward flow in blue and the backward flow in red, oddly during the very highest flow period, we'll get both. And we don't know if it's like um, like waves back and forth. But anyway, we, we subtract the, the backwards from the, the forward flow to get the, the net flow. Sometimes there simply is backward flow. And the data manager, um, when we were sharing the data with someone, said there must be something wrong because you've got negative flow. But we said, no, there really is negative flow. And we're pretty con confident of that. So that's a big advantage of this system. Under frozen conditions, we haven't had any problem. It's it's rated below. The manufacturer says there shouldn't be a problem. Obviously, like any system, if you have water in the pipe and that freezes, you're going to cause problems. We did insulate the covers of these manholes or culverts. Um, and then Kyle took a picture of this when the top was actually frozen. I don't know if you can see it, but we're looking down and there's ice on top. But down below, there's still some liquid water and the system continued to function. The maintenance that the manufacturer gives us is that you would just need to replace the battery every few years. It has a very long life. We have ended up needing to replace it more than that. this. The big problem that I've mentioned before, and I, it just really has caused us difficulties, is those lightning strikes. And um, each time, then, we would it would take some time. By the time we would go through our insurance and get the new system reordered, and it would come, I think, sometimes from Germany. The, the last time it came very quickly. Um, but we did lose a lot of data because of that. So looking back over the five years, um, we, we've got four different sites four different plots that are monitored and we're missing from 14 to 44 percent of days of flow, um, very unfortunately. So my final summary um, is that when it wasn't damaged by lightning, this system worked really very well. Um, setup and programming I would say was challenging and you, you wouldn't want to do it without someone with pretty good electronics programming skills because the system doesn't come with a data logger. So you've got to get its pulse output into your data logger. Um, we particularly appreciated the low battery use and the ability to measure backwards flow.